Okay, great. I think we have a good group of folks on the phone now. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on specialty pharmacy data aggregation, opportunities and challenges. My name is Sue Huang and I'm the head of data ecosystem at Datavant, a software company that helps institutions protect, match and share health data. I am joined by John Gianoris, Vice President of Specialty Data Strategy and Consulting Services at Valuecentric. As the number of specialty drugs grows, there is increasing interest in tracking data to understand patient journey for patients on specialty medications. Today's webinar goals are one, to review how specialty pharmacy data aggregation is generated and how data flows Two, explain some of the unique challenges of aggregating and working with this kind of data. Three, showcase a few examples of the kinds of insights one can generate from aggregated specialty pharmacy data. If you have questions, you can submit them through the Q&A box in Zoom and we'll answer select questions live at the end. John, thank you for joining us today. Can you please provide an overview of Valuecentric and your role there? Sure, thank you, Sue. Uh, I lead our specialty data strategy and consulting services for value centric. Uh, I've been in the life sciences industry for over 30 years and for the last uh, 11 plus years have been focused on specialty data aggregation and integration services. Value centric has been a data aggregator for over 18 years and has been supporting customers with specialty data aggregation services for over 10. Today at Valuecentric, we support over 100 specialty brands uh, across 80 specialty pharma manufacturers. We work with uh, entities such as third-party logistics providers, specialty distributors, specialty pharmacies, of course, non-commercial pharmacies, infusion therapy providers, IDN health systems, patient services hubs, copay vendors, nurse educators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in January of 2019, we became an IQVIA company, which has also opened up some new capabilities uh, for us as value-centric in the data integration space. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at. Great, thanks, John. Let's start with a few minutes of level setting so we're all working off a common definition. Can you help define the unique characteristics of a specialty drug and specialty pharmacy? How are they different from prescription drugs obtained from a retail pharmacy? Sure, thanks. So uh, generally, you know, they are high cost, but uh, not always. There's some specialty products that are not as high cost or maybe as high cost as some unique retail products. Usually uh, high touch, meaning there's a good amount of patient interaction, adherence services, and patient education. Uh, usually require, they're highly complex. They require specialized handling, maybe some storage or unique administration. Um, whether it's self, self administered, infused, uh, et cetera. Um, there's not always, but sometimes some unique dosing and titration regimens where you might start on the therapy and take uh, self inject once a week for the next two weeks and then every third week after that, as an example. So they have unique titration regimens. It's typically chronic disease with limited patient populations, such as oncology, immunology, respiratory, neurology, nephrology. Um, but there's, there's also some, some more traditional um, non-specialized markets that are also uh, now handling specialty products. Uh, generally, uh, they're biologics, large molecule therapies. Um, and over the last five years uh, or so, a lot more focus in specialty around rare disease and ultra orphan therapies. Um, in terms of uh, some characteristics uh, and services that you know specialty pharmacies provide in, in contrast to traditional. Uh, and they, you know, they provide a variety of adherence type services, 
certain things like just as simple as uh, types of reminders they offer, uh, patient education, nurse follow-ups, home visits, um, and uh, broader financial support services. So they'll help uh, patients with uh, getting access to the copay programs that are available, patient assistance, versus the patient having to go out to the manufacturer site and register themselves, et cetera. Great. And as the number of specialty drug launches increases, we've seen significant growth in the number of specialty pharmacies. Can you briefly touch upon the major market trends you're seeing here? Sure. Um, so there's actually been a good amount of consolidation, but um, you know, through uh, the drug channels report that we reference here, um, there's actually been growth, but the growth has been driven a lot more by um, IDN and health systems, large health systems that are building out um, their own specialty pharmacy capabilities. But in regards to consolidation, we've seen over the last couple of years where SPs, specialty pharmacies, are buying other specialty pharmacies. So OptumRx, over the last uh, three, four years, of, has bought multiple specialty pharmacies like Briova, RX, Avella, and Diplomat. Uh, distributors have been uh, creating their own um, pharmacies. So McKesson bought Biologics. Uh, Amerisource Bergen has uh, US Bio under them, uh, and they have Theracom for non commercial pharmacy dispensing. Patient services hubs have expanded to acquire uh, some specialty pharmacies for non-commercial dispensing. So companies like Connective RX, Trial Card, All Care Plus. Um, I think you know if you've been following this industry, you probably know about the payers that have been uh, building out and acquiring and growing their specialty pharmacy capabilities. So there's been a lot of activity, um, just to name a couple, Cigna with Accredo and CVS Caremark with Aetna just in the last year or so. Um, where there's been growth, so that's a lot of the um, consolidation. On the growth side, it's really, like I said, driven by the ID and health systems. So uh, companies like Ascension and UPMC are, are building out or going out and um, maybe converting some retail pharmacies capabilities to specialty pharmacies. There's also been a growing trend where uh, GPOs are becoming uh, intermediary aggregators because they have certain services uh, to combine uh, unique uh, hospital pharmacies together. So companies like Accelera, uh, Apexis, uh, Assembia are bringing multiple hospital IDN type uh, specialty pharmacies and offering that data uh, back uh, to manufacturers where now an aggregator might further um, aggregate them. Uh, so with all that said, it, it, it makes it more difficult for the smaller independent specialty pharmacies to continue to thrive. Um, so if they're not getting acquired, um, they have to create a niche for themselves. So companies like Panther RX, Biomatrix, or CINI um, are touting that they could support rare disease type or ultra orphan uh, patient populations um, and touting their you know, enhanced services that they can provide in that space uh, in contrast to the larger and mid-size specialty pharmacies. Um, some of them are focusing on just key therapeutic areas that they have strength in, whether it be uh, oncology or human growth hormone or hemophilia. Um, companies like Onco360 has done, paid a lot of attention and focused on, just based on the name, right, oncology, um, specialty-based products. U.S. Bioservices originally, you know, was launched as a specialty pharmacy that manage multiple um, specialty therapies. They focus more over the last few years on supporting oncolytics and oral oncolytics. Um, it, it's a, it's a com very competitive space. It, it, with the consolidation, 
the top five to six specialty pharmacies really represent um, about 70% of all specialty uh, prescriptions in the country per a drug channels report from last uh, earlier this, uh, no, late 2019 or so. Great, very interesting. Definitely seems like many stakeholders are moving towards building specialty drug dispense capabilities. Um, in terms of the distribution and supply chain process, what are some of the differences in the distribution process for specialty drugs compared to non-specialty drugs? Yeah, I mean, when you look at this slide, um, there's not a big difference between how a retail product uh, is distributed in contrast to a specialty product. But once you dig in and you look at um, some of the nuances, so uh, there is usually a manufacturer or a third party logistics provider that is getting product out to a distributor or wholesaler in the retail space. In the specialty pharmacy space, it's typically a third party logistics provider, unless you're a large pharma manufacturer and you have your own capabilities. Um, there's usually less distributors called specialty distributors. We've seen in our experience where a manufacturer might just have one specialty distributor. We've seen between one and five. Three is about average. Um, there's Less pharmacies, it is limited distribution, so there's less pharmacies. If you can imagine how many pharmacies there are and, and outlets, right, unique uh, dispensing pharmacies, there's a lot less uh, for specialty. And generally, we've seen on the high end, we've, we've worked with customers that have in the 20s uh, in terms of limited distribution partners um, to companies that only have one specialty pharmacy. And as the patient population decreases, it's usually the less pharmacies uh, that are required. Um, for, for a product that is largely specialty pharmacy distributed, uh, a manufacturer may decide to not even use a specialty distributor. They could just ship direct or through a 3PL ship direct, have the product ship direct to the pharmacy. Um, you know, patients generally are receiving their product uh, not by walking into the pharmacy, but getting it through the through the mail, like a traditional mail order prescription. Or the product might be sent to a doctor's office or clinic where that patient would then get um, uh, the product administered by a, by a healthcare professional or get some education by the healthcare professional and then administer it going forward from home if it's a self-injectable. Uh, usually, um, you know, to get a specialty product dispensed and shipped to the patient, it takes days, not minutes, uh, as we're all used to in a retail uh, pharmacy. Uh, but when you get to rare disease and ultra orphan, because of unique requirements around prior auth and you know testing and all those things that need to go with a rare disease or ultra orphan, it could take weeks before a patient gets approved uh, on product. So in that case, with what manufacturers are starting to offer, where there is unique titrations and other services that need to be uh, done before a patient gets on therapy, um, they, they will offer things like a quick start program or a bridge where the patient gets access to free goods while their benefits are being approved and while additional uh, information is being gathered. Um, there's more intense uh, copay program offerings. Um, uh, it's been rare where I've seen a specialty product that didn't have a copay program off offered. So um, those are some of the key differences. Great, thanks. Let's move into the uh, part of the presentation where we talk about patient level data flows um, and how to capture a complete view of the patient journey. So can you talk about how the data flows for specialty drugs, and in particular, how do the methods by which you collect this data differ for drugs that are administered in a buy and bill distribution model where the provider purchases product up front uh, versus a white bagging or brown bagging model where the patient pays for the product up front? Yeah, so I mean, uh, 
you know, generally, again, there's some, some related services that are similar to uh, what would be required for a retail product, but you, you know, some of the uniqueness in regard to specialty is the product um, could be distributed through a pharmacy, but it could also be purchased by a doctor's office, a group practice, a clinic. So there's some unique characteristics there. Usually with a specialty product, you see the patient hub or intake um, component on this slide. Many times a manufacturer is paying for a patient services hub to be an intermediary um, for the patient uh, and or uh, the physician's office to support you know, the patient's benefits being verified uh, before being directed to a specialty pharmacy. Uh, so there's some unique uh, characteristics there. It's also something that at, does add time to a patient getting on therapy, as I said earlier. Uh, the good news about specialty pharmacy, because it's through limited partners, specialty pharmaceutical products, I should say, because it's through limited partners, there's generally a richness and depth of data that's available directly through the partners that you choose to be in your limited distribution network and providing uh, services um, back to the patient. So the data is really rich and deep. You can get from a specialty pharmacy claim from a pharmacy, um, you can get multiple updates a day on what's going on with a patient claim. Um, many of the large and mid-sized specialty pharmacies not, not only support uh, pharmacy benefit claims, but they can support medical benefit claims as well. So where your product might have a component of the doctor's office or the clinic purchasing product, or where you might have a decent uh, percentage of buy and bill through medical benefit uh, for your product, when you are selecting specialty pharmacies, it's important to understand which ones can support medical and pharmacy benefits. So we've seen some of that interaction and some uh, pharmacies really grow in, in offering medical benefit services, not just pharmacy. Um, uh, when it is a pure buy and bill, and there is no specialty pharmacy in the distribution, so it's all being purchased through the hospitals, clinics, group practices, uh, et cetera, the ability to get deep and rich patient level data is diminished. It's harder. Um, you have to come up with a multi multi multiple ways uh, to get access to that data. So uh, some options are you can purchase data from syndicated data providers like IQVIA, our parent company, uh, Symphony Health, Decision Resource Group. There's some other companies that CrossX offers some, some data as well. Uh, there's there's uh, EMR data providers that have, uh, you know, where the EMR system is in, in put in place at the doctor's office, the health system, and they collect uh, data on, on the patient. So companies like Flatiron, Athena Health, Intrinsic, uh, where you can, you can actually buy data directly uh, from them. Claims processors like Re Relay Health. So these are the ones that work mostly to get the payer to get to uh, to support the uh, the claim being adjudicated by the payer, um, so companies like Relay Health, Truvis, Truveris, excuse me, Watson Health slash Truven. Um, so with those types of data assets, the the issue there is you're getting pieces uh, of inform. You're getting uh, you're not so with a limited specialty pharmacy where it's pharmacy benefit and medical claims, and they're all going through a specialty pharmacy. You're getting access to 100% of your patients. Uh, as soon as you go buy and bill or broad buy and bill with no pharmacy, you now have to start piecing uh, more data together from different sources or decide that you're, you know, using a source or two or three sources is good enough and having 60%, 70% of patient lives is good enough for the analytics and decision making. Um, I need to make. We've seen some unique, um, some some unique. Uh, instead of the clients maybe using uh, those types of data providers, 
Um, we've seen where customers, manufacturers have put requirements in place that before a physician's office can order a product um, for treatment of a patient, the order needs to be placed through the patient services hub. And the patient services hub then is collecting the patient information from the physician's office before approving and, and, move, uh, and moving the order forward to a specialty distributor. Uh, we've seen that a couple of times with some of our customers. Nope, you know, um, and I'll give another example and I'll caveat it. Um, certain specialty distributors, the top three for sure, offer what are called depot data service, depot services. What that means when the order goes into like a Cardinal, Amerisource, Bergen, and McKesson specialty, they're actually taking some information from the physician's office as well and recording that information before the order uh, is shipped. So information on the prescriber uh, and, and even some, in, some patient characteristic information. Um, the issue with the last two is that th at that point, you're making the decision to have your customers, the doctor's offices, the clinics, the hospitals, to provide additional information um, before they can actually get products. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a pull and a push kind of thing that you need to think about um, with that model, but we've seen a couple of customers institute that model. Great, uh, thanks for clarifying some of the nuances and how data needs to be sourced depending on the distribution model of the product. Can you tell us more about value centrics process for working with a manufacturer to aggregate data from all these various sources and integrate them? Sure, yeah, I mean, th so this is our, this is a, an overview of our process, but it's not, uh, I don't believe that this is unique to uh, what's offered. This is generally what data aggregators offer, at least the good ones, um, right? So um, what's important to understand before you, you get in and start providing data aggregation services for a customer uh, is you really need to understand how is the product being distributed uh, or going to be distributed. Um, we've seen a lot, you know, our, a lot of our growth has been with pre-commercial customers that are um, preparing to launch. Um, generally, or usually their very first product or at least their very first specialty product, but understanding uh, how is the product gonna flow? How's it gonna be distributed? Um, is it predominantly specialty pharmacy or is there a specialty pharmacy and a health system component? Where, is there a buy and bill? Um, will there be a 3PL along with a specialty, a set of specialty distributors or not? Um, how many specialty pharmacies? What types of services are you gonna be offering? Uh, the physician's offices, uh, and, and the patient. So are you gonna have a quick start, a bridge, or is there gonna be copay? Will you be using a patient services hub? Will the patient services hub be managing the quick start and bridge, or are you gonna offer a quick start and bridge through your specialty pharmacies and uh, your hub? So uh, really understanding the product flow and then the services that are gonna be provided, that then def defines the entities, right, that are gonna manage your patients, your physicians, and your product. And through combining, uh, bringing that together, then there's a set of data uh, assets that are then available from those entities. So when you look at the, um, above the, the graphics and you look at the types of data sources, so from a, um, you might be getting uh, inventory and sales data from a specialty distributor, X factory sales from a 3PL, um, you know, from a pharmacy, you might be getting status and shipment level information at a daily uh, level. You know, so when you understand that, that defines the types of data that are available. Uh, once you define the types of data that are available, you then need to make sure you understand the KPIs that the manufacturer is interested in um, following, managing. So across the manufacturer stakeholder teams like trade, commercial, brand, finance, market access, what are the KPIs that are important to them? And then by understanding the KPIs, that then drives the specific data exhibits that should be contracted for 
from those entities. At Value Centric, we have um, best of breed data layouts that we generally use as a starting point once we collect that information and we use the best of breed layouts to either remove or in some cases add because there's different brands and different therapies have unique uh, requirements. So it, there is no overall standard. I have yet to see across the um, 80 manufacturers and over 100 specialty brands that I've worked with where across manufacturers within the same therapy, they've used the same exact data layout. There's differences. And you need a good uh, data aggregator to understand that and help the manufacturer um, with putting good data exhibits together. And in addition to that, then helping them close out uh, their data agreements with the specialty providers. Great. So then once you determine the data aggregation strategy and working with the manufacturer, what are the steps involved in actually bringing in that data, processing it and integrating it? And then what are the end deliverables for your manufacturer clients? Sure. So this is the one slide that is uh, value centric guys, if you will. Um, and I cuviatize <laughs> to boot. Uh, so you know, on the left-hand side, you obviously have, the, this is just a sample set. It's not uh, what every customer does, and, 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 and it could be a subset of what some customers do. Um, but you, you have your, your on the left-hand side, you have the most common types of data uh, assets that are available from your specialty providers. Uh, if, uh, you know, longitudinal patient tracking is important, which has been more and more important over the years and continues to be uh, a growing trend, uh, in particular with, you know, what I said earlier about rare disease and ultra orphan product launches. Um, you know, you need to make sure you have the appropriate longitudinal, HIPAA compliant, high, high, high tech um, patient DID solution in place. Most aggregators offer that. Uh, you need to have it if you're a data aggregator. Uh, it has to be, um, you have to be, have the ability to link a patient across time and source. Whether the source is a hub, an SP, a copay vendor, linking that patient through their journey consistently at a, a, at a very high level um, is critical. Uh, you need to then have the traditional data aggregation services, making sure that that data, it, you're working directly with the specialty partners, to make sure their data is coming in in a timely fashion, uh, that it's of high quality, that it's accurate. If there are issues, working with the specialty partners to resolve any data quality issues while keeping the manufacturer informed uh, of what's happening uh, with data quality. Uh, there's the ability, right, and it's becoming also a growing trend to take the, in particular when uh, there is a buy and bill type of a component or maybe where the product is going through specialty, but it's, it's a hybrid network where it's preferred specialty pharmacies, but products also available through retail. We, we have some customers that do that. And when you have those hybrids and or a blend of buy and bill and specialty, you need to bring in or supplement the data that you aggregate with syndicated data assets or claims data or EMR in this case, like I said, this is an IQVIA view of the world. Um, so we could integrate data in the exponent, prescription level, plan level data. We can integrate it into syndicated uh, patient level claims, rejects, reversals, and things of that sort. At the end of that, all manufacturers want that data at the transaction level. So they could do things like patient journey tracking. Uh, they could have their field reimbursement management team calling on physicians offices and making sure physicians are aware of what's going on if a, in a HIPAA compliant de-identified way by the way um, ensuring that uh, patients aren't getting unstuck if they're stuck if the doctor's office um, you know it needs to follow up on something and the field reimbursement manager sees that the doctor's office hasn't followed up for three days on a particular patient um, getting that transactional level data and having a, a report that's available to a field reimbursement manager. And in our case, we do that through our value track platform. And knowing that that data is daily, a field reimbursement manager can interact quickly with the physician's office 
or in some cases, depending on the model the manufacturer has set up, directly with the specialty pharmacy and or the hub to, to work on getting that uh, patient unstuck. That's the transactional data. That's what the patients, folks in market access, field reimbursement and trade typically look at. Um, on the commercial side, you would have your traditional data, data going into a data warehouse, uh, a CRM platform, perhaps a, um, an enterprise reporting platform solution where data becomes more broadly available. Um, and just to call out some key examples of how, so, you know, uh, on the trade side, right, the trade team is really responsible for keeping an eye on what the specialty pharmacies distributors are doing. Are they holding up their end of the bargain? Is the product getting through the distribution channel? uh appropriately is there you know hopefully there's no um inventory or stocking issues uh so they'll look at that data daily um someone in market access uh so you know the per the group that really manages some of the patient services in the hub uh, they're going to want to look at that data right to ensure that patients are getting the services and getting access to the products in a timely fashion that's where that transactional daily data comes into play that patient journey, uh, reporting and analytics come into play. Um, just, a, just a quick plug for Value Centric, we've actually created um, an AI ML capability that actually looks at that patient data and predicts a patient that's at risk and not getting their first fill or at risk and not um, going and getting the refill by looking at the therapy gap days. And, um, prior interactions with that patient and or patients of similar kind. Uh, on the commercial side, there's the traditional, we wanna make sure that the product is uh, growing the way we expect it to grow. Prescribers are writing product, patients are getting access to product and representatives are performing uh, appropriately. You got your brand and market marketing teams that really wanna track the product uptake. Are campaigns working? Do they need to change messaging? And of course, finance, um, who's, if you're publicly traded, you, you got your Sarbanes-Oxley reporting requirements, you need to manage your forecasts uh, and things of that sort. So those are, those are examples of how an aggregator, um, and in, in this case, how value-centric helps those groups, those stakeholders within pharma get access to data in the specialty distribution space. Great, thanks. So let's move into a discussion about use cases and the value of aggregated specialty pharmacy data. You know, I'm sure there are many use cases for aggregating this kind of data, and uh, two of the common ones are patient adherence monitoring and market access insights. John, could you walk through this example of how aggregating data for a specialty drug can be used to monitor patient adherence? And what's an example of a, a change in strategy or approach that you've seen manufacturers implement based off of the insights generated for tracking this kind of data? Sure, so yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through this um, in a couple minutes here. So this is a simple view of the world, it could be more complicated than this, but um, you know, just to give you a, a, a purview in, in regard to how a customer uh, could track patient adherence by getting the data directly from the specialty pharmacy. So here's a case where a patient gets enrolled through the specialty pharmacy. Now, it, the pharmacy could get the referral directly through a physician's office, or perhaps the referral came through a, a patient services hub. But um, so patient gets enrolled, right? When the patient gets enrolled, there's a certain set of criteria uh, and services that need to be performed to ensure that that patient um, can get approved, right, for the product. So there's the investigation of benefits, and in some cases, the enrollment form might not be complete. There's missing information. The pharmacy has to follow up with the doctor's office. They then need to check in with the um, insurance, the payer, um, to verify benefits. They might find out that, well, for this patient to get a benefit, a prior off is required, so they have to submit 
the prior auth, they put the prior auth in, perhaps they have to appeal the prior auth. Uh, if it comes back denied, eventually the prior auth is approved. Um, once it's approved for um, prescription, it gets shipped and the patient receives. In this case, let's see the patient receives the product at their home. Um, now, that entire part that's time to therapy, remember I said earlier, it could take days. Uh, so for maybe an oral product that's not overly complex, uh, that's got a broad network um, and fairly adopted by uh, payers, it, it could just take uh, three, four, five days to get through all that. But when you have ultra-orphan rare disease, um, where maybe there is no net, uh, preferred payers, um, there is a smaller set uh, of pharmacies, there's more rigor, because uh, usually with ultra-orphan rare disease, there's significantly higher priced products. That could take weeks, uh, not days. So time to therapy uh, obviously is important. You wanna get as many patients that are referred on the product, and then you wanna understand if a product, if a patient doesn't get approved for product, why is that? So the data that you contract for can be used to A, determine time for the therapy start, but even if, it, or perhaps why a therapy didn't start. Um, but let's, say, let's continue on and then I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple examples. So the products received, the patients on therapy, uh, and they need to get, they need to get the product um, refilled uh, every 28 days, let's say, right? So then there's, once the patient gets the product, the manufacturer might have a nurse call as part of the service with a specialty pharmacy to follow up with the patient. Hey, you got your product. Um, do you have any questions? It's been three days since we shipped it. Could be seven days, depending on the product. Um, just to make sure everything's okay and the patient got the product. They might do another follow-up um, at day 25. Maybe the follow-up is through a text or an email. Hey, you're due for your refill. Just checking in, make sure you want it that you're gonna get it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it's shipped. Or maybe what happens is the patient doesn't get the refill. Maybe even though the first time that it went through and it was filled and the payer approved it, it was approved with an asterisk, meaning that the, they get the first fill we want the patient to get on therapy, but they're gonna need to move to a different pharmacy because they're not in our network. So there's all these little nuances, right? And the data that you collect and the, the granularity of the data that you collect could help you understand um, what's happening um, with that patient journey, just utilizing th this simple model. So some examples of how customers use this data. Uh, you know, if it's a network of seven, eight specialty pharmacies, let's say we've seen where customers benchmark the pharmacies against each other uh, by looking at time to first fill. And, and we've, we've actually had manufacturers who've decided to reduce their network by eliminating some of the, lo the lower performers or patients that really, uh, or uh, pharmacies that really have very low patient populations going through them. Uh, we've seen examples where um, the manufacturers decided to add additional nurse education services or perhaps uh, move the nurse education services from just the hub, perhaps doing nurse ed. And so, you know, where you, there's models where we've seen where the hub actually was doing all the nurse education, where the hub had to see everything that was happening with the patient from the pharmacy to where they move nurse education services back down to the pharmacy because they're having the more direct interactions on an ongoing basis. So those are two examples of uh, how manufacturers have used that data uh, in the past. Thank you. Can you walk through the second um, example use case now of generating market access insights? And you know, what's an example of a change in strategy or approach that it has resulted from this kind of data tracking? Yeah, so um, this is, uh, gives you a little bit more complexity. So we have 
uh, a specialty pharmacy still in the bottom left-hand corner, but then we have an interaction where things are going back uh, up to the patient services hub, um, and then the patient services hub is then uh, triaging the patient uh, to another specialty pharmacy. So I'll, I'll walk you through this quickly. So in this case, again, the enrollment happens at the specialty pharmacy directly, uh, not through a hub. In this case, it's directly through a physician's office. Um, you know, the specialty pharmacy will do the BI, verify benefits. They find out that through the benefits verification process that the payer has rejected um, the claim. So at that point, the instruction in pharmacy is, all right, well, get it back up to the hub, triage to the hub, and let the patient services hub determine really where that patient needs to go next. Um, so at that point, the hub is collecting some additional information, discussing with the patient, the physician's office. They'll investigate benefits, they'll verify benefits to, to, uh, with the payer. Uh, the payer approves the benefit, the benefit then is, the patient is then triaged to a preferred specialty pharmacy that that payer works with, all right? And then the patient's uh, enrolled at that pharmacy. Uh, the pharmacy will still verify and approve the benefits even though the hub did it because at the end of the day, the pharmacy wants to ensure that they're gonna get paid for the benefits that they're providing the patient and that the patient uh, is gonna get the product and that they're gonna get paid for the product. So even though the hub just did all that, it ends up that the pharmacy does it again, but um, maybe not as an, intent, as an intense process as it was at the hub. Um, so it does get approved at that point. The product is shipped and received by the patient. But if you could imagine the prior model where time to, time to, first ther time to therapy start, time to first fill, let's say happened in five days uh, at one specialty pharmacy. When you see something like this, where it's pharmacy hub, pharmacy, that's when you're getting into the 10, 12, 15 plus days um, to get a patient um, on therapy for their first fill. So some examples where customers have been, our, our customers have looked at this data uh, and have made some uh, adjustments or decisions. So, you know, I've seen this and our customers have told us about this as well, but we've seen it in the data where when a doctor's office doesn't know where the patient really should be sent, but they know that there's a limited um, set of specialty pharmacies, they'll actually send the referral to multiple pharmacies. So now you got a patient going to two or three pharmacies and whichever pharmacy is faster at either. Um, so long story short, so they're, they're, it, com it, com it completely confuses the, sometimes the patient because there might be multiple uh, entities calling on the patient. It confuses the physician's office. So uh, by looking at the data and understanding what's happening, we've seen um, manufacturers who then really educated the uh, physician's offices where the sales reps and the field reimbursement reps are leaving uh, information behind for the offices to say, hey, if it's this payer or this payer, these are the ones that are in their network in terms of specialty pharmacies. This is who you should refer that patient to. Um, uh, this is the preferred pharmacy or the preferred two pharmacies uh, for that payer. So we've seen that uh, be a um, effect of looking at this data. Um, We've also seen through this process where um, manufacturers have decided to uh, increase. So th th what I didn't include in this diagram is once a patient is approved um, through this process, um, how, have they, how have they changed any of the services they provided? So to keep a patient on therapy. And we've also seen through this model where um, the nurse education services have been, have, have been enhanced. So it might have started with some really basic uh, information um, to the extent where maybe a single call was made to where there's two or three uh, interactions that are made. Um,
So th those are some examples. Oh, you're on mute, Sue. Thanks so much, John. Definitely speaks to the importance of uh, tracking data on as granular of a level as possible to be able to find out what's happening on the ground once a, a specialty drug launches. So thanks for walking through two of those uh, use cases. Um, so that actually concludes our prepared content and we can now take some questions. Uh, John, do you want to look through uh, the Q&A box and select questions or would you like me to do that for you? Um, I see a couple questions on here. Um, so that it says, could you address the role of clear bagging compared to brown and white bagging? Uh, hey, I got to tell you, I've, I'm a data aggregator. I work with a lot of data. I've not actually heard uh, the term clear bagging before. I've certainly heard white bagging and brown bagging. So I'm not certain on what clear bagging is. Um, I think that's something we need to take back and maybe provide um, to our audience as an, a follow-up answer. I'm, I'm not familiar with that term, to be frank. Sure, let's take that as a follow-up to go back to the person who asked. Uh, okay, so someone, uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll take the next one. What about the, the next one? What are the most common KPIs that value-centric sees when acting as the aggregator? Yeah, I mean, there's medical possession ratio, therapy gap days, time to first fill, um, uh, uh, um, abandonment rate, success rate, right? How many patients are that are referred get on to therapy? How many patients that are referred don't get on therapy? And then what are some of the reasons they don't get on therapy? Um, there's all the traditional stuff. Uh, how many, you know, looking at payer um, information uh, of, the, of the claims that go to a certain payer, what's the percentage of that payer approving versus denying a claim? Um, who are the prescribers? Sometimes depending on, dependent on who the prescriber is and the prescriber's office, um, you know, looking at how well prescribed at a prescriber level, how well their claims, their patients are getting through the approval process. Sometimes it happens to be the office staff that's just not doing the right things to get a patient through the initial referral. Um, there's traditional commercial, um, commercial things um, where, you know, uh, product growth at a geographic level, um, uh, forecasting, um, you know, f forecasting calculations. Um, the data is used for incentive compensation many times to compensate reps. Uh, those are just uh, 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 some examples of um, K KPIs. Great, thanks. We have a, another question around the kind of um, predictive analyt analytics services that's possible uh, through Value Centric and what you offer to manufacturers. And in particular, do you utilize just the specialty pharmacy data or are there other clinical data sets that you'll oftentimes add to that to make those predictions? Yeah, so uh, it's two part. So. The first, I mentioned our AI ML capability. Um, in, in that regard, in, our, in terms of our AI ML capability, we're actually looking at the daily uh, claims information that is coming directly from, at a patient level, de identified, directly from the specialty providers. The, in, in, so for um, predicting whether a patient will get on their first fill. It's using the data from the patient services hub and the limited distribution specialty uh, pharmacies. That's to determine the um, uh, time to fill and whether they're at risk of getting filled. And we use attributes like who is the physician's office, uh, who is the payer, um, how long uh, what information was uh, provided on the referral form? Was there missing, missing, missing information? So was the status awaiting physician feedback, awaiting patient feedback? 
So it, 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 it uses this kind of, it uses two different machine learning AI models to, to intersect um, uh, across the various sets of data that are provided. And it learns based on prior patients that were successful, as well as prior patients that were not successful in getting on therapy. So it alerts, it creates an alert to a, over a 90% accuracy level that this patient is likely not gonna get on therapy or they are likely gonna get on therapy. Um, for the ones that are highlighted that are likely not gonna get on therapy, it, it, it actually will, uh, the RAI ML model then takes interactions into place. So what additional things did the pharmacy or the hub do? But also, if, the, if, if they're using a field reimbursement team or a home office team that is also taking action directly with the physician's office or with the pharmacy and hub, it actually captures the interactions that the home office or field reimbursement manager took, and it'll record that. So based on then interactions taken and putting that into the uh, AI ML model, it'll then uh, use that information to then suggest uh, what next action the field reimbursement manager or home office person should take based on uh, those previous interactions that worked um, to try to get that patient unstuck. So that's all the data self-contained within the data aggregation um, model. Uh, being part of IQVIA, we have um, then the ability to also take, so for, for example, for patients that did get approved or didn't get approved, um, the ones that didn't get approved, we could look at other claims level, re, uh, other pharmacy claims level data, um, to determine did that patient uh, get put on or referred through another manufacturer's product. Um, so there's a, now when it goes from, when it leaves the network, um, in, this, in this one example, when it leaves the, the client's network and perhaps goes to a different specialty pharmacy and they go on, on a competitive product, um, that's where our, IQVIA AI ML team steps in and uses the data we have along with the, let's call it medical claims and uh, pharmacy claims data that's available through their claims data set and they bring it together and then they add additional AI ML um, uh, capabilities and predictive analytics on top of that to let customers know what happened with patients that were never approved. That's just one example. Uh, there's other examples where, you know, um, it might be it might be that the patient had an emergency room visit. They never got on product because they had uh, some other event happen. Um, so there's there's things like that that when you take the limited network data and combine it with other transactional patient level data and link that data to that same patient in a HIPAA compliant high tech way, you can make other determinations and do other predictions. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we do have a clarification. We can probably take one last question. Um, we have a clarification from the original uh, audience member who asked about clear bagging, and it sounds like overall the, the question is around um, what is the role of clear bagging as defined as systems only using their own specialty pharmacy to provide um, a prescription to the MD for administration? Okay, so this is where the pharmacy is part of, it sounds like, can't talk to this person live, uh, it sounds like this is where the, especially pharmacy itself, is within the health system. So one of the IDN uh, health system pharmacies that uh, is uh, making, uh, taking that patient from what happened at the doctor's office, keeping them within the health system, and then, um, uh, um, you know, getting that patient then on therapy through the health system's own specialty pharmacy. So what I've seen there, uh, and it's, it's a dynamic that's evolving, um, 
what I what I've seen there is at some point uh, there's a fight for who keeps the patient. So when that when that specialty the IDN owns specialty pharmacy clear bags and gets that patient on for therapy through the uh, through their parent IDN, uh, they may not be able to keep that patient because again because of the pay the insurance coverage and the payer um, they may push that patient uh, to uh, one of their preferred specialty pharmacies versus uh, the health system pharmacy. So I, I mean, I may not be answering this fully. Uh, I certainly know what white bagging and brown bagging is and how that works. Um, uh, but what, what I'll tell you about clear bagging with the IDN on specialty pharmacies is, although they fight to get that patient on their first therapy start, um, sometimes they lose them because of the uh, payer uh, situation. Got it. Great. Well, um, I think we're going to close here. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. And thank you very much to our guest, John Gianoris, for sharing his insights. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we'll be following up with you separately. We hope you and your families are staying safe. And thank you again. Hey, so I'd just like to close, too, if I can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I, I, hey, I wanted to thank you all for your questions. Uh, it was a spend, uh, excuse me, a pleasure spending some time with you today. Uh, if you like what you heard, um, this is my little sales pitch. Uh, please visit the Value Centric website to get access to some additional materials. I actually have a couple of video clips that you could look at that go into some of the topics in more depth um, that we've discussed today. Um, I was interviewed uh, by Specialty Pharmacy Times uh, as well as Healthcare Analytic News and those video clips are on the site. So you could look at those clips, but you could also take a look at some of the content that's on our website. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Yeah.